Uh, so to begin with, uh, I'm going to talk about to start Sierra, which is the newest of the advanced simulation and computing advanced technology systems at Lawrence Livermore. Um, ASC is part of the NNSA, the National Nuclear Security Administration, which is one of the two major pieces of the Department of Energy in the US. And we have two different lines of systems, basically uh, commodity technology systems, which are largely commercial off the shelf technology, uh, just very large Linux clusters. And then we also do advanced technology systems, which are the biggest systems that we build and kind of you know, establish where things are going and hopefully eventually lead into things being available down there. So I'm gonna first tell you about Sierra, which is, as it says, is the newest system. We uh, cited this over, mm, well, now it's about a last, the last year and a, and a half, uh, and then it was accepted in September, and it's currently number two on the top 500 list uh, behind Summit, uh, which is essentially its sister system, and I'll tell you a little bit about what's different between them. Uh, so first, a little bit of eye candy. Um, this is actual Sierra on, on our floor, not too far from my office. Um, it's an IBM system with Power9 processors and NVIDIA Volta GPUs, two Voltas for every Power9, two Power9s and four Voltas for compute name. Um, and it's all water-cooled, so you see the tubes coming in and leading all the way through back out. All right, it's housed in uh, building 453, which is this building here, as I kind of pointed out, the other one my office is up there. Um, and here's a little more eye candy. Now, <laughs> something more realistic. Uh, okay, so Sierra is part of CORAL, the collaboration of Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore. Um, so CORAL is this three-way partnership between Oak Ridge and Argonne are office, DOE Office of Science Laboratories, all right? And they house the leadership computing facilities for the Office of Science. So they, they cite the largest systems for that part of the Department of Energy. Uh, Livermore is part of the NNSA Tri-Labs, and the ATS systems uh, alternate between being cited at LAML by LAML, uh, Los Alamos and Sandia, and at Livermore being cited by us. All right, so before Sierra, we had Sequoia, which was a Blue Gene Q system. We still actually have it. It's still number 10 on the top 500, um, but it's, so it's kind of a smaller system for us. And it's, its lifetime is limited. Um, it won't be around much longer than maybe September of this year. Uh, but that system, we cited, and we were also working closely with Argonne, and not too long after we cited Sequoia, they cited a system that was half of its size called Mira, right? So it's another Blue Gene Q. Uh, so there you see Sequoia. And um, basically, we modeled how Coral works similar to, similarly to what we did with Sequoia and with Mira, which is we actually had, um, in addition to, to contracting way far in advance to buy um, a big system from IBM. We also agreed to fund um, what we call non-recurring engineering. All right, so that's uh, advanced uh, R and D uh, to make sure that the system we end up getting actually uh, meets our requirements. So basically, uh, investing in, in what the company can offer us in order to get better return on investment on our overall uh, platform value. So for Coral, uh, as I mentioned, it was to, with these other two labs. And so the idea was that we were going to have two of these long-term uh, contractual partnerships. Um, and so we would release the RFP, say here's our requirements, and get back a bunch of responses. And from those, pick the um, set of two responses that provided the best overall value to the Department of Energy. All right? Um, and from that, um, 
basically, so as I mentioned, Oak Ridge and Argonne are both Office of Science laboratories, and so they have a diversity requirement. So they couldn't they couldn't pick the same system, and there had to be some clear uh, significant differences between the two systems. So that was part of the value to the Department of Energy. And so one of them would get one of the two systems in our set of two systems, and the other would get the other, and then Livermore would pick whichever one we felt best met our uh, needs. So um, the two sets of systems we picked, one was an Intel system um, that actually is not getting built. It was going to be Aurora and was supposed to be delivered in 2017, just the same way that uh, Summit and Sierra were, were delivered in 2017 and then accepted in 2018. Uh, this system has morphed into what they call A21 and still sometimes call Aurora. Um, it's an Intel system that's being um, integrated by Cray. We have Luis and Heidi here from Cray. You could ask them about that machine and they won't be able to tell you, but. Um, just the same way I can't tell you anything about it. So, um, not that they don't know, just we're not allowed to talk about it. Yet, so, I can't say more than that. Um, but originally, so, so uh, Livermore and Oak Ridge picked this IBM system with uh, Voltas, with NVIDIA Voltas, and the plan was to cite them in 2000, start citing them in 2017, and have acceptance done in 2018. We met that goal, so we're very happy with that. Um, and originally, they were pretty much very similar systems. Uh, the main difference originally was that Oak Ridge always said, we're going to get three GPUs per Power 9. And we said, we will probably get two GPUs per Power 9, but um, we might get three. We have the option to change our minds. Uh, and we ended up going with two, and they ended up going with three. Um, our original reason was that our codes had not yet been running on uh, large scale uh, accelerated systems. Uh, as we went through it, we actually just decided that two was a better choice. And I actually still believe that two is a better choice. Like I think the numbers show that two is a better choice. But, you know, everybody makes their own decisions, and has their own workloads that they have to optimize. So here is kind of a big picture of what the Sierra architecture looks like. And, in a little while, I'll tell you about the differences to some, but for now, I'll focus on Sierra's. So as I said, it's Power 9 processors, uh, CPUs connected to uh, NVIDIA Volta, GPUs 2 per Power 9, um, uh, 2 Power 9s and 4 Voltas per node, so that gets you a compute node. The Power 9s are connected to the Voltas with the second generation of NVIDIA's NVLink technology. Right? Um, so now you'll often hear us just, uh, we almost always talk about it as a two to one ratio. And there's a reason for that because the NV link goes directly from one of the power nines to a, to half of the, the voltage. All right. And, um, the connection between the power nines is the only way to get from one side of the node to the other. And that's a very relatively low bandwidth link. So, Effectively, you end up always wanting to use the node as, as essentially what we call two virtual nodes. All right, you're, you're, you're not ever really going to, to run the, a node, a, a, a single process crossing over those, um, over that link because the bandwidth is too low. And if you did any sharing, you know, get good performance out of that. Uh, so, NV link, it's the second generation of NV link. Uh, and that's important. The first generation was available with uh, Power 8 Plus processors and Pascal uh, GPUs. All right. And so I gave you relatively high bandwidth connection from the CPUs to the uh, GPUs. But what it didn't give you was support for hardware coherence. All right. And we do get that with the second generation of NVLink. So, in fact, this has a fully coherent shared memory across all of the uh, processors on the node. Um, and that makes it a lot easier to program, although there's still benefit to making sure that you actually like stage stuff into the memory you want to compute on. All right, so associated, well, so the overall node has uh, 256 gigabytes of DDR4 uh, DRAMs in uh, eight in slots. 
Um, so that's where the, the main place where you store data, but when you're actually wanting to compute on the GPUs, there's uh, 16 gigabytes per GPU of HBM2 uh, on each GPU. All right, so that's in a set of four stacks, uh, basically. Uh, so that's, that gives you very high bandwidth memory uh, to use on the GPUs, all right? And so typically, what you're gonna wanna do is get all of the data that you're computing on right now into that HPM so that that way you get high bandwidth connection in, into actually the data you're actually computing on, all right? Um, I'll tell you a little bit more about that in a minute. So you take 18 of these compute nodes, you put them in a standard 19 inch rack, connect them with the Mellanox uh, EDR InfiniBand network uh, with copper rack switches on each of the uh, racks uh, and then tapering from those switches into director switches. And I'll tell you about that, a two to one ratio. And then you take 240 of those racks, gives you 4,320 nodes. You get 125 petaflops of performance. Um, so each one of these nodes is roughly uh, 29 teraflops of performance uh, in and of itself. Um, you get 100, you know, you add up 256 gigabytes of memory plus another 64, which is 320 gigabytes of memory per node. You take, multiply that by 4,320, you get about 1.29 petabytes of memory overall. Uh, and all of that takes, uh, it says approximately 12 megawatts. It's actually more like 11 and a half, but 12 is, you're guaranteed you won't take more power than that. All right. And then we also have a, a fairly large uh, spectrum scale or GPFS file system with that. Uh, so 154 petabytes of usable storage. Uh, it says here 1.54 terabytes per second, maybe it's uh, appropriate that the line is cutting that through because, oh wow, well, you know, uh, because actually so far we haven't reached that level of performance on the file system. IBM is committed to still trying. I think we're never going to get there, but are you far away? Uh, it depends. More <laughs> so we're probably more like around, definitely can get one terabyte, 1.2 is pretty much achievable. Uh, 1.3, 1.37 is kind of on the edge. I don't think we'll get much over 1.37, 1.4. Right. But we'll see. All right, so this gives you kind of all those same things I just ran through in one nice, easy to read chart. Uh, and what it also shows is that there's this other system called Lassen, all right? Uh, so Sierra is a classified system. Uh, in fact, uh, just the middle of last month, we moved it from our unclassified network to our classified network, so that it's now fully uh, up and running in production. Uh, but we also bought a, a fairly large uh, unclassified resource. So this this is a 40 rack system. So you know it's kind of the little brother of, of Sierra. It's one sixth the size. Uh, it's number 11 on the top 500. Um, so we got 720 nodes there, and as you can see, everything else kind of reduces proportionally. And that peak power is again kind of approximate. This one I didn't raise up for the last couple of racks. Um, anyhow, so that, that's what the system looks like. Um, well over 95%, more like 98% of the uh, floating point capability is in the GPUs. All right, so that. So if you want to run on this system, you need to make use of the GPUs. It's pretty much simple. You can you could just run on out of the power nines and then uh, we'd want to strangle you. But, okay. um, so this tells you about the details of the, the Volta. Uh, you got 80 uh, symmetric uh, multiprocessors per Volta. Uh, each of those has 32 uh, double precision floating point units, which can then be used as 64 single precision floating point units. Um, but they also have eight tensor cores. Um, so what's a tensor core? All right, a tensor core is 
um, something that's basically built kind of on the top of the floating point units uh, that does uh, four by four matrix multiplies. All right, but those matrix multiplies take uh, half precision numbers as inputs do the accumulates in single precision, and so they output uh, 16 uh, single precision numbers. All right, and what that does is it basically eliminates round off errors. All right, uh, apparently these tensor ops are very useful for uh, machine learning for you know, convolutional neural networks. I don't know, um, but. What you do see is that, um, so if you take it, the peak of this thing, if you ask IBM, it's uh, seven teraflops per second peak. Uh, if you ask NVIDIA, it's seven and a half. Uh, the, the reality is probably somewhere in between or somewhere, you know, it depends. Depends on whether or not it's hot, in fact, all right? So it has uh, some automatic clock gating that will reduce the, the clock speed once it starts to get hot. So if it's cold, you can get seven and a half teraflops per second. If it's hot, you're probably closer to seven. All right, that's double precision. Single precision, you can double those numbers. So you can get 14 or 15, because you have twice as many floating point units. But for tensor ops, you can get 120 tensor ops a second. 120 tera tensor ops a second, all right? So that is, in fact, um, a factor of the uh, math, eight, no, not eight, 16 more than you can get in double precision. So um, there's quite a bit more capability available if you can use those tensor apps. And in fact, um, the Gordon Bell prize winning uh, papers from 2018, they ran on Summit, has a few more uh, GPUs. Uh, as I mentioned, there are three GPUs per Power 9 instead of two. They had a higher budget. They bought basically a third more. They had about a third more and a little bit more than that budget than we did in the end. Um, but uh, one paper in particular got over three exa-tera ops. So in fact, uh, exascale computing is already here today. Uh, the other one that there, there were actually two winners this year. The other one was over one X. Uh, all right. Anyhow, so as I mentioned, the HBM2 is very important because that's where you get almost a, a terabyte a second of bandwidth to uh, add out of memory. All right. But one of the challenges we face is how do we apply uh, those tensor ops to more traditional workloads rather than uh, machine learning? All right, and, I, and I'll, uh, I'll note that those um, Gordon Bell winning prize papers that I mentioned were basically doing convolutional neural networks, right? They were basically just doing AI. So I'm not gonna say it's not hard to get a, a, an extra tensor out because that, that would be grossly unfair. They were very good papers, very, very well done uh, science, um, but it's a lot easier to do it on something that the hardware is designed for than figuring out how to, take what the hardware is giving you and apply it to, to a more traditional way. All right, so I mentioned that, that we have tapered the network. Um, what I also mentioned was that we have 256 gigabytes a second, I mean 256 gigabytes of DDR4 per node, all right? Um, if you have a really good memory and you, were, you heard me talk two years ago, you might remember that I said we were gonna get 512 gigabytes of memory per head. And in fact, on Summit, they have 512 gigabytes of memory per head. Uh, why do we only have 256 gigabytes of memory per head? Well, um, in addition to funding this non-recurring engineering to help make sure we get what we want, we also, so if we ask uh, a uh, vendor, uh, a company like Cray or IBM, to bid on a system three years in advance of when they're gonna sell it to us, uh, they don't know how much some of the components are gonna cost them at that time, all right? At the time they actually have to buy it. And in particular, memory is very uh, hard to predict what the price will be that far in advance, all right? Um, 
So if we ask them to bid a, a fixed price and to say this is how much memory we're going to get at some cost, that what they would do is build in a lot of um, contingency into the price that they offer us when they think about how expensive the memory is going to be. So we would get less machine um, if we asked for that. So instead, what we do is we say, okay, we're willing to um, take on basically the risk. We, we call it a risk sharing clause, but basically we own the risk for the price of memory. Right? So we, at the time we sign a contract, we say, here's our best guess as to the price of, of what memory is going to be. All right? But when we, we actually go to buy the system, when we actually go to buy the memory, that's when we'll set what the actual price in, in the contract will, act, will be. All right? And at that point, it will be you know, some number. In theory, it could be the same as what we predicted. It almost certainly won't be. It will be probably either more or less. Uh, and it could well be more or less uh, than what we predicted. Well, we needed to buy the memory for our systems at the beginning of 2017. At the beginning of 2017, or actually towards the end of um, 2016, um, mobile phone providers started telling all their users, you should get a lot more memory. You would get much better performance on your phone. You could you know, stream videos much better, and, and things would work much better on your phone. So the cost of memory, so the demand for memory shot up, and so therefore the cost of memory started shooting straight up, uh, very precipitously. And in fact, over a period of roughly three months, the cost of memory more than doubled. All right. So there we were, where we were finally able to actually say, okay, we're ready to buy this memory, and it was still going up at that same rate. And, and here's what we're going to have to pay for it. Great. What do we do? All right. Well, our contract said we had four options. All right. So option one was we could pay more. Uh, you might be surprised. IBM came to us and said, we know how to handle this. You should pay more. <laughs> we said, no. You see, as we've told you, we only have a certain budget. So that's not actually an option. Um, and they said, oh, okay, well. I guess you won't pay more. Uh, the next choice is then uh, we could get less system. We could reduce the size of the system to compensate for the increase in memory cost. And so their next response was, you should just make the system smaller. And we said, no, that's really not very appealing either. We don't think that's the best choice. So the third option was that we could actually reduce the amount of memory we get. All right. Well. We based, I, I looked at it and I realized we could get um, dims that were half the size of the dims that we were originally expecting to get. So basically, I guess it was, we could get, I guess there's 16 slots. I, if I got it right, we could get uh, 16 gigabyte dims or 32 gigabyte dims. All right. So we could get 256 gigabytes of memory or we could get 512. We would get the same amount of bandwidth. All right. So that's what really matters as far as the performance we're going to see. Now the question is, is 256 gigabytes of memory enough memory? Well, uh, our main use for the system is uh, uncertainty quantification, right? So UQ work with. All right? <laughs> and what UQ is, is it basically you're running a bunch of big parameter studies and a bunch of big ensemble studies, right? And so it's essentially a throughput workload. And so we looked at it. And we went back to our, our uh, application teams and said, well, what are you going to run on this? How do you expect to, to use the system? All right. And, and our, our workload is also a multi-physics workload. So it's um, big simulations of different physical processes and that combine to form you know, simulation of one kind of stuff. That's our main workload. We also have uh, applications that do a single type of physics, but uh, that's not the dominant workload on the machine, all right? And so they said, well, um, most of our, our physics packages, the, the way we figured to, to use them, because it's the way we can most effectively use the system, is we're going to stage in memory for the package, compute on it for, for a good while, getting a lot of reuse, and then stage that memory out, stage in memory for the next package, and so on, all right? In fact, we only had one type of physics that, that looked like um, you would actually have to stream memory in and out 
for while that package is run. All right, but you, you don't get enough reuse that you might as well just, you could go basically as big as the memory to support. All right, so otherwise though, you're basically limited to um, the 16 gigabytes per GPU or 64 gigabytes per node per package. And then they said, well, and this is how many packages we wanna have and reuse of data across those packages. 256 gigabytes is more than enough. We can run our pack. Our, the problems we put plan to run in that memory. Wow, great. So we'll just cut it in half. Machine still runs what we want. In fact, we probably never should have been planning to buy 512 gigabytes of memory. But we were. That was the way you know, this, the system was originally designed when IBM proposed it. Well, okay, so that seems like we're there, right? Well, remember, I said that the cost of memory more than doubled. All right, so in fact, we were still not able to fully cover the additional cost of memory by cutting it down. So, you know, IBM said, well, great, but yeah, you're right, you'll get the same performance, you say that's enough memory for you, no problem, just make the machine a little bit smaller, and we're done. And we said, no, that's still not really very appealing. What do we want to do about that? Uh, well, we looked at it, so I mentioned that we have these commodity technology systems, these Linux clusters that we're buying. And CTS-1 was already being put on our floor. We have a number of machines like, like that already. Right? They use a similar technology to the Mellanax EDR. They use uh, uh, Intel OPA, but it's essentially another InfiniBand network. Right? And we're, we had decided, we've done a bunch of studies, and we had decided to buy all those machines with two to one tapered fat trees. All right? And we're running very similar applications to what we'll run on Sierra, and they're doing great. They very little difference to if we had a full full uh, bisection bandwidth factory. So we, we looked at that and we said, actually, we think that if you got rid of half of these director switches, our, our, our apps would still do just as well, and in fact, we would more than cover the cost. And so it turned out that well, IBM didn't really like that idea. We had lots of arguments about it, but eventually, you know, we said, no, that's what we want to do. We had to, we had to like, make them some guarantees that they said, oh, you're going to really kill performance. The benchmarks that you make us sign up for the numbers on and stuff, it's going to be way, way lower. And we said, no. we know these applications better than you do. They're not going to afford that. We, in fact, we told them, generally, it's going to be less than 1%. In the worst case, on most of them, it's going to be maybe a 5% hit. And, oh, by the way, when, when we taper the network, not only do we have, save enough money to cover the increased cost in memory, but we save enough memory to increase the size of the system by 5%. All right, so for most part, we're looking at less than a 1% loss in performance and 5% more machine on a throughput workload. That's you know, more than 4% more work. So that was an easy choice for us. All right. Um, so to contrast that with Summit, um, Summit, as I mentioned, has three voltages per per GPU. Now I, sh I didn't say, but I will. So um, I told you that the, that it has the NVLink connectivity, right? And there's a certain amount of, of NVLink bundles per power nine, all right? And so you can either divide them in two and share them with two GPUs, or you can divide them into sets of three and share them with three GPUs. So you can get, with three GPUs, 100 gigabytes a second per power nine, or with two GPUs, 150 gigabytes a second per power nine. All right. Well, um, basically that's the big trade-off there. If you do ever want to stream stuff from that DDR4 into the GPUs and then back out. So if you're really making a lot of use of that DDR4, you probably want more bandwidth there. I did say we have one package that needs to do that, that actually needs to do the streaming in the way we're using the system. That actually happens to account for a large portion of, of the uh, execution time, uh, particularly since it is doing that streaming, but just in general, it's a large piece of the workload of many of our, of our multi-physics applications. So that performance was important to us. And so that, again, kind of led us to the going with two voltages per power nine. But also, again, if you have three, now you've got um, 96 gigabytes of, of 
HBM, so you know the ratio is, is kind of changed. Would you be able to fit in 256 gigabytes? Not so clear. All right. Um, Summit still has a full bandwidth battery, and Summit also has 512 gigabytes of memory per node. I already mentioned this stuff, but basically for our workload, this is the choice we made. Um, I'll note that all of the Gordon Bell papers were computing just out of GPU memory, so I don't know. But for whatever reason, Oak Ridge said, when IBM said, you should pay more, said, okay, we'll pay more. Um, I, I guess they have a printing press there. Uh, anyway, so for us, this is clearly the right machine. You can judge whether or not it's the right machine for Oak Ridge. I don't really know, but that's that's the machine they want. Get better as the next week, so we can consult. Yeah, he's not really that closely involved in, in the the large procurements. It's kind of peripheral to that. More the different crowd of people that I interact with mostly for that stuff. Um, anyway, so for our benchmarks, which yeah, so we have a set, so as part of the RFP, and kind of the biggest part of the RFP is we have a set of benchmarks. And we said, you have to tell us that you're going to make a certain level of performance. All right. On um, Coral 1, we were looking for somewhere between 5 to 8 perf uh, factor of improvement over Sequoia and Oak Ridge's previous uh, big system, Python, which was a Cray system, which also had NVIDIA GPUs. All right. Uh, Sequoia is a totally different architecture. I'm not talking about that, but they're roughly the same in overall performance. Uh, which one gives you better performance on a particular application kind of depends on that application. All right, but well, we divided them into two main categories, uh, throughput uh, benchmarks and scalable science benchmarks. All right, the throughput benchmarks are basically intended to kind of model uh, kind of how our, our UQ workload works where you run many jobs over the overall system, and you're trying to get high throughput through. So uh, what you end up doing is running them on uh, several instances of them on the machine at the same time. So these results are 216 nodes per benchmark, uh, 19 inst instances overall. So 19 different run jobs running at the same time, uh, and then separate four-hour sessions for the optimized and the baseline results. So what's the difference between the optimized and the baseline results? The baseline results are basically um, our benchmarks as they stood at the time we, we started the RFP, all right? Um, there are very limited rules as to what you can do to and, and count as a baseline result, all right? So you can add pragmas, things like OpenMP, um, some other minor things, but you can't go and completely uh, reorder the code, add a lot of uh, low-level code and say CUDA, uh, but you can do a few things to make it sort of run on architecture, all right? Uh, optimized is basically anything goes, but you have to tell us what it is. You have to show us that the code changes, and then we get to see it, and hopefully we can look at it and say, we can see a path from here to there, um, and then hopefully this path isn't too bad. So what we see is that the uh, optimized results for the um, throughput codes, we ended up with a factor of 6.41, all right? Um, the number on Summit for, for these same benchmarks, remember they got, so Sierra is a 125 petaflop system with uh, two GPUs per node. Summit with a little bit more than a third more budget is a 200 petaflop system uh, with three GPUs per node, you get uh, about 6.7 on some of those. So for our workload, this is clearly the better architecture. All right, and also I'll note that UMT is a problem that's intended to, uh, well, the problem size and, and, the, and the application is intended to characterize when you're not able to run out of GPU memory. All right, so it's large enough that you can't run out of GPU memory, so you actually have to stream through it. Uh, even there, though, we're still getting a factor of 2.72, so it's a pretty significant improvement. All right, and then here are the scalable science results. And scalable science are, are codes that the idea is usually they're, they're like a single physics code 
and they're intended to run over the full set of size of the machine. All right. And here, what we got, uh, the interesting thing, so we get about 5.57 on uh, Sierra and baseline of 4.8. So these codes actually out of the box run very well on that machine. All right. Um, okay. The, you get actually, it goes up proportionally on, on Summit. So you have, it, it's pretty much what is the, the installed um, double precision capability on the machine that tells you pretty much what number you're going to get on that. Uh, I'm going to skip through this kind of quickly. This is uh, one of the Gordon Bell Prize finalists from this year. This one was run primarily on Sierra. It, they also did runs on Summit. This was the only one that um, actually is a traditional simulation code. It's a quantum chrome dynamics code. Uh, they got about uh, 15 petaflops, if I'm remembering correctly, on uh, Sierra. Uh, OK, so but I do want to take a little bit of time to talk about something. So when we look at where, so the Sierra architecture has these tensor apps. And in general, when we talk to companies about where they're going with hardware, um, there's a lot of hardware that's really very oriented to run uh, machine learning well. I just probably are just shocked to hear that. Um, that's where the money is. So that's where the hardware is going. So what we're looking at is, well, we have to find ways to make better use of that. All right. So one of the things that, that we're, we're doing at, at Livermore is we have a a project that's looking at what I call um, adaptive precision refinement. All right, and so basically, what that does is, if you're familiar with adaptive mesh refinement, you um, you know places where error is high in your simulation, you, you resolve the grid more finely, and therefore you can drive the error down. All right. So for adaptive precision refinement, the idea is that you compute at lower with lower precision numbers, but you basically stack them up at the same grid point. All right. And so if your error is high, you add more numbers at, at the lower precision, and then you can use that to, to basically get um, the equivalent of using higher precision, but you only do that at specific grid points. So your overall, um, over your entire simulation, you're using uh, fewer bits to represent the, the overall so, all right, that's one interesting idea. Whether or not that'll work is, is unclear. Uh, for half precision results, the dynamic range of the numbers is really not large enough to represent a lot of interesting problems. One thing that thing that we're hearing about is people are talking about using B floats, which are not uh, IEEE half precision numbers. They're half precision numbers with um, an exponent that's the same size as a single precision exponent. All right, so the mantissa is small. Right. That gives you the same dynamic range, roughly. Um, and that might well be a, a way that we can actually use that technology using half All right, well, anyway, so uh, what we're looking at is something that we're calling cognitive simulation, which is ways to build AI into our traditional simulation workload. All right, this can be as simple as doing things like um, using uh, machine learning to be able to pick out the input parameters that you're running for a UQ study. All right, that's a pretty straightforward thing and it's basically using AI outside of the main uh, application. But we're also looking at ways of building AI directly into the simulation, uh, whether it's um, things where you're kind of building that kind of steering more deeply into the application or even doing things where you're predicting what um, the physical result would be and basically um, fast forwarding past doing some of your simulation. Um, this is, may sound like science fiction. We're already actually actively doing this. We have uh, an application that, that's gone under various names. Um, typically think of it as the Splash app. Uh, we also call it the Pilot Project. Uh, what it is is it's a, a project um, joint with Livermore, the National Cancer Institute, and also um, the Candle Project that's part of the Exascale Computing Project. All right, and basically what it does is it's, it's simulating, um, 
It's simulating RAS proteins, which are in, important in, in certain types of cancers that they've had very little success in treating. Right? And they really don't understand the processes that these process that these proteins go through and how they impact cells. All right. Uh, and so the thing is, is in order to understand the, the proteins better, what you'd like to do is use traditional molecular dynamics to simulate them. Uh, but you, in order to understand how they work in the cells, you need to do this at much larger uh, length scales, so you know, problem sizes, and over much longer time periods than what you would normally be able to run a molecular dynamics simulation. So they have a continuum model that they can use, but unfortunately that is not very accurate yet. And so what they, what our, our team has done is they basically built in a way to run that continuum model, uh, use machine learning to kind of estimate, do we have enough knowledge at this point, at, at these parameters to know that the result is pretty accurate, or do we need to do something to refine it? If we need to refine it, uh, take those, those you know, the parameters that characterize the problem there, and spin up a molecular dynamics simulation to get a, a, ref, a refined understanding of, of how things are going to behave at that point, and then bring that back into the continuum simulation. So basically using it with uh, interpolation to get you the answers that you need. Um, and this is kind of all preliminary, so I won't go too far into it beyond that, but it is uh, definitely a way that we can build uh, machine learning much more into uh, our applications. Okay, so enough on cognitive simulation. Let me instead talk about OpenMP. So, uh, as you may know, we released OpenMP 5.0 in November of this last year. Um, but when I when I took over, when I when I became chair of the OpenMP Language Committee, it was actually shockingly now that I look back on it. Uh, 2009, 2008, we had just released OpenMP 3.0, and uh, we were hearing criticism that people weren't really sure like how to plan on uh, when OpenMP would move forward at, at what rate. And so we said, okay, well we're gonna we're gonna adopt a five-year cadence for major releases. So every five years we will release another major version of OpenMP, and two years after we release a major version, we'll release a minor. So in 2010, we released OpenMP 3.1. In 2013, we released OpenMP uh, 4.0. In 2015, we released OpenMP 4.5. And last year, 2018, we released OpenMP 5.0. So we've actually done a pretty good job at, at keeping to that. Uh, another thing that we did um, following, I guess, 4.0 is when we really fully adopted this. We said we're going to start releasing every year. If we're not releasing a, a new version, we'll release a technical report that is essentially a draft of everything that we've already adopted for the next version. All right. And so every year we either have a, a draft technical report or a major version. All right. Or, or a new version, whether it's uh, 5.0 in 2018, PR8 next year, or this, this November, uh, 5.1 in 2020, uh, up to 6.0 in 2023. Uh, I actually went back and looked at it. Uh, the first version of OpenMP was released in 1998, so we've actually done a very good job at, at establishing this five-year cadence even before I started doing it. Uh, leading this stuff, but uh, so we so that you can actually pretty well bank on it. Uh, now I'll tell you a bit about what we're doing, what we've done in 5.0. So we've added a lot of stuff. If I tried to talk about all of it, it would take far too long. Um, 5.0 is a big addition to OpenMP. So uh, OpenMP 4.5 was about 340 some pages in the PDF. Um, the Official part of the spec in 5.0 is over 600 pages. It's about 666 pages for the overall PDF. Um, so it's a big advance. It's, it might sound like we more than doubled things. I don't think we did quite that much. We added 
um, two things in particular. Well, this, this one little bullet here accounts for a large portion of the new pages, um, and, which is that we added two tools APIs. <coughs> we added a, a, a first party tools API, which is basically uh, within OpenMP, within an OpenMP process, there's now a way for tools to go and get information, um, get callbacks about when events happen in, open, in your OpenMP program. All right, and that's typically used for uh, performance analysis tools. Uh, there's also a lot of correctness tools you can build on that. And we also then also added a third party tool interface. So that is where you have a process running outside of your process and it attaches to it and it can go and interrogate that process and find out things about the state of the process, right? And what typically uses that is debuggers. So it's basically a debugging API, but we, we use these two different terms because we don't want to limited potentially so as I said a lot of correctness tools use the first party interface potentially a performance analysis tool could use the third party interface although oftentimes that uh, process to process communication is too heavyweight but anyhow so that that alone so those alone at we had two new chapters for that they account for probably two-thirds of the new pages in the spec uh, and then throughout the rest of the spec there's all things that detail for this tools API, you must do this or this. You know, here are the events that correspond to this OpenMP construct. All right, but we did add a whole bunch of other stuff. Um, in fact, you know, like counting lines of code is not a good measure of how much code, you know, how much a, a certain program does. Counting pages of a spec isn't good, a good uh, way of estimating how hard it is to implement something. This is relatively easy, accounts for most of the pages. Uh, some of the things we added, like the meta directives, and I'm not going to go into, but it's basically a way to, um, based on the context in which your program is executing, determine what OpenMP uh, actions and constructs are applied to your code. All right. So that only took about three or four pages, really. Um, and it's probably about the most difficult thing to implement in the spec. And, um, you know, it, don't, don't count lines of code, don't count uh, pages of specifications, actually look and understand what's involved. Uh, anyhow, so in, right now, our OpenMP is important to us with Sierra because um, it was largely how we looked at our millions of lines of code. We have several applications that have more than a million, million lines of code in them, right? And porting those to a GPU, now counting lines of code in that instance, is somewhat reasonable because you have to somehow get that code to run on the GPU when it's the code you want to run on the GPU and not the code you want to run on the CPU, right? And doing that with CUDA would have been pretty invasive in our codes. So instead, we were wanting to use a directive-based approach. I mentioned that 4.0 came out in 2013. So we were looking at that saying, our codes already use OpenMP um, with maybe fairly minor modifications. We can use OpenMP 4.0 actually be able to make use of the GPUs. This has actually worked out pretty well for us. Um, I didn't talk about real numbers. I talked about benchmarks offline. I can talk about real numbers. But basically, our, our codes have, have largely succeeded in moving over to using the GPUs. But in 4.0, we added the support for heterogeneous nodes, for adding device constructs. And the basic uh, thing we added is a simple blocking offload model, where you have this target construct that says, Run this code on that device over there, all right? And for each one, you have to basically say, map that, that data over to the device. So actually, in that region, I'm gonna use this, this data. Um, and within a target region, you can use any OpenMP construct that exists in the spec. So you can use uh, typical work sharing tasking. So you have a loop, you say, parallelize it this way. You can use tasks. We also added teams and distribute constructs. So um, these are similar to parallel and uh, OMP4 or OMP2, um, but they're kind of more targeted for using GPUs or accelerators that maybe don't have synchronization between them. And I'll get to that in a minute. Uh, in addition, you can say, okay, I'm gonna have multiple uh, target regions that I wanna execute on that device that are gonna use similar data but for some reason, it's hard for me to make them just one big target. 
right? Maybe I have to do some computation that is better done on the CPU. But the data is going to be over there, so I can map that data over with a target data region, have it over on the device, and execute multiple uh, target regions that operate on that data in that time frame. All right. 4.5 added a whole bunch of improvements for, for this device model. Uh, probably most significantly, it uh, clarified that each of these regions is a, a OpenMP task. So um, if you put no weight on this, it executes asynchronously the code at executing on the host. All right, so an example will make it a little bit clearer as to what we do. So here we have target region, we map uh, arrays V1 and V2 over to the device. I would probably give these a map type of two since I'm actually just reading them, but I didn't because it saves some space. So I'm writing it out. And then we have P that I'm going to map over there, and maybe I would map the, that as actually from. So, I'm gonna, so what that means is I'm going to copy the da data over to the device, uh, but not copy it back. And here I'm not going to copy the data over, but I am going to copy it back. All right. By default, the map type is two from, I copy the data over, and at the end of the region, I copy it back. All right, so how does that work? So on the host, I have a, a set of threads running on this host team, and one of these threads encounters this target region. All right, so what's gonna happen is that tells the compiler to offload that region to the device and copy the arrays, as I said, uh, create a league of teams on that device. So we're gonna create uh, a master thread for each team in the teams region, and then within those, due to the parallel region, create a bunch of threads within each of those teams. All right, and at that point, we're gonna go and compute on that device, and when we get to the end of the parallel regions, parallel four regions, we're gonna have barriers across all, all right? But then we're not gonna have a barrier across all the distributed regions. So this is, means that what you can actually do is pretty easily map this to like a warp, and then this is like a, a whole block of code, right? Um, anyhow, once all of the uh, computation finishes, it, the compiler will then ensure that the data gets copied back to, to the host. All right, so what did we add in 4.5? Um, what, what are some of the most significant things we added in 4.5, in 5.0 rather, to improve how this device model works? Uh, one of the biggest things we did, uh, so I mentioned that we have coherent shared memory supported in hardware on, on um, with the Voltics, all right? And that's a big advance. Uh, when we told our, our, our application teams when they were showing us what they wanted to do with OpenMP, we said, oh, but you got to, there are implicit rules for mapping, but if you, act, if you access data down inside of a function, the compiler doesn't then the compiler doesn't know to copy it over. So you actually have to tell it what to copy over. And oh, by the way, if it's a pointer-based structure in C, you actually have to describe, you know, it's not like in Fortran where the compiler is already memorizing the length of arrays and stuff and it knows how much data to copy over. So you better actually, you know, back up here, I was telling it, there's n elements there. Copy over n elements, copy back n elements, all right? So you actually had to do all that mapping in order if you're accessing array-based arrays that are represented as pointers. All right, but they're like, but the hardware doesn't require me to do that. Well, in theory, the compiler could use a completely different address over on the device than it uses in, in on the CPU. Right? There's nothing that requires it to use the same address. Now, true, what kind of crazy compiler writer would make it do that? Probably nobody. So we were like, yeah, you know, if, if you just assume that require that, that shared memory works, it'll probably work, but your code is not correct. And they hated that. So what we did is we added something that we call um, the requires construct. And there's different requirements that you can say, my code has this requirement for this translation. And in particular, you can say, I require unified shared memory. So now you no longer have to add these map clauses. They're, You've told the compiler, they're gonna be there, don't do weird things with the addresses, just use those same addresses. And if you don't support shared memory on this device, you can, you can just not, you know, fail to compile this code. You can tell me it doesn't work. I don't support shared memory. All right, so that's good. 
Um, and that, that greatly eases using these devices where you have shared memory. All right, I'm gonna talk next about this. What's going on here? Um, that's a declare target uh, construct. And it says, compiler, I'm gonna access that function over on the device. Why do you need that? Because the compiler needs to know to generate a version of the function that can execute on that device. All right. Well, in 4.0 and 4.5, you had to basically annotate every definition, every declaration of a function that you used on a device with a declare target construct. And this is um, true whether you're talking about CUDA, uh, OpenCL, OpenACC. They all tell you, if you want to have a version of that function on or that device, you better tell me. Well, um, frankly, we, we looked at this and we said, why? why? Why does the compiler need me to tell it that? Look, I'm, ac I'm accessing this function in this target region. What is the compiler going to do there? Well, if you're familiar with compiler technology for C++, it's very similar. What it's going to do is it's going to take that name, mangle it, and say, here's the name of the entry point that I use for that function on that device, all right? And when I go to link, I'm going to ensure that that entry point exists and it's gonna link up and it's gonna be great. So why did I need to tell the compiler that how to mangle this name? It already knows how to mangle it, all right? So we said, don't need it. Now, and this was us as user members of OpenMP coming to OpenMP and saying, we don't need that. We don't want to have to do that. It's horrible. Um, the compiler writer said, but you'll get a link error. And we said, our users are used to getting link errors. That really doesn't bother them. That, that's the sort of thing, like, that makes sense to them. They'll go, oh, I didn't make sure that you generated that function. I or I didn't link it in. My mistake. I'll fix it. All right. So, so they said, really? really? Yeah. But we went further than that. All right. So what we said is that if this function is used here, I don't need to tell you how to mangle it. So I don't need to have a declare target on this declaration. But then suppose in this function that I now know I need to generate a version of for that device, I, I execute another function. All right. Well, I'm generating, you know, I now know that I have to execute on, on that device. So I guess I should not, I should just mangle it appropriately. So what we ended up saying is any uh, declaration, so any use you don't, inside of a, a device region, whether it's in a function that you're generating for the device or in a target region, you don't need to, you don't need to do anything to, to declare, you don't need to declare a target to tell the compiler how to mangle. But also, if you can see the definition in the same translation unit that you actually have the use of it in a device region, then compiler, you have to generate that version for it. I don't have to tell you. All right? I mean, it's trivial. This is how compilers work. It's like I got a simple table. I'm keeping information on it. Boom. All right? So with that, we've seen actually that many of our complex C++ codes have gone from situations where um, you either had to have just thousands of, of declare target annotations, um, or in fact, because of some of the rules about where you could put those annotations, you actually couldn't generate the device version of the function that you wanted, to now where we generate, um, where we're able to execute these large C++ codes on GPUs without using a single declare target. That is a huge vet gain for our teams in, in uh, productivity. All right. Um, so I mentioned that, that now you don't have to tell a compiler how to move the data. But uh, I also said on Sierra, if, if you know you're going to be computing for a while, you may actually want to actually describe what data to move into that share, into that um, HBM. All right. Now, if you have pointer based data structures, it's not easy. It was very difficult, in fact, to describe the data that you would want. All right. So if, if you had this kind of linked list or you know uh, some pointer-based structure inside of there that then actually turned into an array, the compiler doesn't know how much data to move over there. And so what you ended up having to do in 4.0 and 4.5 was 
uh, map over this data structure, map over the data that was pointed to, and then patch up the pointer so that they pointed to the right location. Really painful. Uh, so what we added is something called the Clara Mapper, which is a very simple way to describe this kind of recursive mapping. All right. Uh, it doesn't handle all cases perfectly, but it gives us um, what we call deep copy support. All right. It gives us kind of the first that's that's uh, exists in an annotation-based language. We're looking at, at adding some additional refinements to that, um, either in 5.1 or 6.0. All right, so I'm going to finish up with telling you about El Capitan, which will be Livermore's next ATS system. So I told you that we've got Sierra uh, sometime, I can't really say when, in theory, 2021, uh, LANL will cite Crossroads. Um, in 2022, uh, with acceptance in 2023, we're going to cite a system that we are calling El Capitan, which will be the system that replaces Sierra just the way Sierra is replacing Sequoia. So at some point, we'll have El Capitan and Sierra both on our floor at the same time. So um, El Capitan is part of the Coral 2 RFP. Um, which is very similar to the Coral One RFP. It's again the collaboration of Oak Ridge, Argonne, and Livermore. Uh, and again, in theory, we could buy three systems off of this contract. Uh, and again, we're going to be using non-recurring engineering contracts in order to improve our return on the return on investment that we get. We found this model works really well. Uh, we're very happy with it. Uh, and the intent is that. Oak Ridge will get their next major system. It will be a 2021 delivery acceptance in 2022. They'll call that Frontier. We'll get our next system, El Capitan, 2022 delivery acceptance in 2023, as I mentioned. Um, and possibly Argonne will get a, a system with 2022 delivery, 2023 acceptance. Um, what that means, it's not clear because you know, they could possibly choose to do that if something went wrong with their uh, A21 Aurora procurement, or they could possibly choose to buy an additional system besides A21. I think. All right. Um, anyway, so this is, uh, you, if you've heard about Exascale and the Exascale Computing Project, uh, there's also the Exascale Computing Initiative. These are the the first systems that, that will basically be cited that will be um, double precision exascale systems in the US. Uh, so uh, quickly I'll go through what our targets are and I'll give you a little bit of, uh, way back when somebody, you know, a bunch of people met, they, they wrote a paper, gets quoted all the time and said, here's what we must do in order to cite an exascale system. Some of it was very right, some of it was very wrong. Some of it, I don't know where they got it from. <laughs> uh, so in the RFP, we say that these systems have to consume less than 40 megawatts of, of power, um, with it being strongly desired that they be between 20 to 30 megawatts. All right. If you look at the, that paper that I mentioned, it says exascale systems absolutely have to be less than 20 megawatts of power. I don't know where they got that from. All right. So, um, our machine room floor, we can already get 45 megawatts of power. All right. Now, I mentioned that we have Sierra and Sequoia running at the same time, one in one room and one in the other room, but using that 45 megawatts. So we don't have 45 megawatts right now to put the one machine because we're using about 10 of it for Sequoia and about 10 of it for Sierra. So that doesn't leave us you know, 45, but it leaves us 30. All right. Um, in fact, we're upgrading our, our facility and we'll be going to 65 megawatts within the time frame that we'll be putting this machine on the floor. So we could actually easily do 40. We could probably go higher than 40 if we don't want to, but we could. All right. All right. So next, reliability. Um, the requirement is that the machine will stay up and running uh, for at least, jobs will run for at least six days without human intervention due to failure. And that doesn't mean that, that there will be no hardware failures in those six days. It means that if a job stops due to a hardware failure, 
that the system has to be able to automatically restart it and keep it running. And there's also uh, that the overhead will be under, I think it was 25% or more. So basically out of six days, you have to get about um, four, four and a half days of good computing and not have to do anything other than just let the machine run. Maybe it's a little bit of exaggeration, but that's the reliability. This is the one I don't know where, where they got the numbers from. So what, what you hear, and you'll read this though in, in research papers today, that exascale systems are gonna fail all the time. They're gonna, there's gonna be a failure every five minutes. They're gonna go, nodes will be going out every 30 minutes. And it's just gonna be you know, havoc. We absolutely have to have completely new approaches to reliability. Um, now, I don't know, but I can tell you, well, I don't know where they got those numbers, but I can tell you what would happen if I bought a machine that, that had hardware failures every five minutes and jobs were dropping out every 30 minutes. All right, I would be looking for a job. I like my job. I'm not buying that machine. All right, so I don't know where they ever came up with that. If they'd asked me, I would have said, no. So I, I like to put it this way. So, you know, in the 60s, they sent a man to the moon. They had computers on those space ships, right? On, on the rockets. Those, you took those computers out into outer space. You know, the atmosphere does a wonderful job of shielding things from cosmic rays, all right? Those computers were taken out of the atmosphere. They had a lot of um, cosmic ray events regularly, right? And, they, and yet they still were able to run their computers there. Think about it, all right? We know how to build reliable computers. It's just a matter of investing the money into doing it. And so we expect to see some, some novel things in order to make the hardware more reliable. And sure, improving the way software can handle reliability, reducing the cost that it takes to keep it running is worthwhile. But saying that I'm gonna buy a machine that's gonna fail every five minutes? All right. Um, all right, so we wanna be able to run problems that are worthy of an exascale system. So we, we've said that we want at least eight petabytes of, uh, or pibibytes, so binary, this is an annoying thing. You go to the, the storage guys, they all put everything in decimal units. You know, I'm a computer scientist, so I think in binary. I don't know how they ever got away with that, it really is. But for the load store memory, we want at least eight petabytes of memory. Uh, and we want um, at least 50 times the application footprint in file system capacity, right? Because that basically gives us a certain amount of data that we can save off. Uh, and for the performance, uh, I mean, we don't really care how much parallelism it takes to get there. We care about what performance our applications actually get. So we want to see an improvement in application performance of at least 50x over Sequoia, so the machine before Sierra. Uh, why did we choose that? Well, because we at least the RFP, but we were still citing the machine, so we couldn't really run benchmarks on it to say you had to do these numbers. Uh, if you do the math, it's you know, 8x, 6 to 8x of what you can get on various of, the, um, of our benchmarks on Sierra. And the 50 is also really cool. You can work that one out quite a bit. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'll have to think about that one. This one I would have gotten years on. And that's the Jubilee year, which is seven lots of seven plus one. Okay. <laughs> Anyhow, so I'm confident that we can actually meet all of these high level requirements for uh, El Capitan. So the RFP went out, uh, I think it was March. Do you remember? You would remember better than me. Right. We were at Kurt's meeting, so. Yeah, it's probably like February and March. Yeah. We were doing the evaluation a little while later than that. So in May, I think it was. We've already gotten our responses. We already know what we're getting. I can't announce it yet because we're still in the process of negotiating contracts. But I have reason to think that we can actually make these targets. We may make some architectural trade-offs, right? We may look at it and say, actually, Maybe I don't need that much memory. Maybe I can run my problems more effectively in a smaller memory footprint and use my budget more effectively somewhere else. But 
Um, if we wanted to, we could easily make all of, them, all of those requirements. Okay, with that, I'm basically done. Uh, I will say that you know, people ask me, well, what are you getting? I, tell you, I can't really say. I can say that um, we're very happy with Sierra. Uh, our codes are up and running on it. They're doing well on it. Um, there was a lot of um, kind of angst amongst our code teams that they, they participated with us in the decision to get Sierra and to go with the GPU-based system. Um, but there's been a lot of effort over the last three years to make it so that those codes can run well. Um, I didn't say, but I will say now, if you look at the um, GPU capability compared to the CPU capability on a Sierra node, it's roughly a factor of 16. All right. Um, most of our packages, most of our codes are getting a factor of 15, which means that they're realizing most of the difference between running on a CPU and running on a GPU. All right. Um, a few of them are down at eight. Most of them are at 12 or higher. So, um, and, and that includes any code that they have to run on the CPU, right? And uh, any data that they have to run through the file system and whatnot. So that's actually getting a pretty good uh, speed up on, on our code. So we're, we're pretty happy with it. We've got other uh, GPU-based machines that we've been citing, uh, sm much smaller than Sierra, but uh, we like what we're seeing. And uh, we believe that with OpenMP and some other things that we're doing to, to be able to have our code run on GPU or uh, really lead to us having a, a, an accelerator-based computing era at, at And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions.